Great. So uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome, everyone, to this week's uh, Law Science event. Um, welcome also to all those who will uh, rewatch this session later. I'm Daniel Hefke, JSD candidate and graduate lecturer at Cornell Law School. I am the moderator for the session. Before turning to today's speaker, um, Sital Kalantri, let me briefly introduce the Law Science Project. We are an academic initiative coordinated by a group of JSD candidates who share the same belief in legal methodologies. Legal methodologies are often understood as a discipline distinct from sciences, traditionally consisting of doctrinal analysis and normative questions. And through this um, series of interdisciplinary talks, we aim to show that legal research can be improved and benefit from scientific methodologies that provide more robust and systematic ways to approach legal questions. Um, if you want to learn more about the Law Science Project, please visit our website and join our email list. Um, I'm sure Simon is also going to um, provide a link in the in the um, chat box, and that's actually a good point to uh, introduce the other coordinators. So we have Simon Sun. He's the uh, uh, SJD at Indiana University Morrow School of Law, and he's the co-founder of this initiative. And we have Marilyn Hush, who unfortunately can't join us today, but she's a JSD candidate. Um, from the University of Virginia School of Law. We have representatives at diverse law schools in the US, such as Berkeley, UPenn, University of Illinois, Georgetown, University of Washington, Columbia, and Fortem. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, we're always looking for new representatives. We also host a blog on legal methodology called the Legal Method Lab, for which we always search editors. So if you're interested in becoming either of these, please reach out to us. Um, but let's turn to our speaker for today. Uh, Sital Kalantri is a tenured professor of law and the associate dean at Seattle University School of Law. She previously worked as a clinical professor at the University of Chicago Law School and at Cornell Law School. I won't be able to list all her accomplishments, but among many other things, she was the founder and director of the International Human Rights Clinic at U Chicago and Cornell, as well as the founder and director of the India Law Center at Cornell and now at Seattle University. Her work focuses on comparative law, business and human rights, feminist legal theory and contract law, and her write, uh, writing has been cited by both the US Supreme Court and the Indian Supreme Court. It is a great pleasure to welcome here, her here at Law Science. The session today will be about the research and findings of Professor Kalantri's new book called Court on Trial, a data-driven account of the Supreme Court of India. She wrote this book with two co-authors, uh, Aparna Chandra and William Hubbard, it was published by Penguin Books in 2023. Building on over a decade of original empirical research, the book examines various of the major controversies uh, around the Indian Supreme Court, um, a court that many claim would be the most powerful court in the world and that has fascinated not only scholars in India, but comparativists and constitutional lawyers for decades. Um, we will have time for Q&A at the end, so um, please pick their questions. Since the event will be recorded and uploaded to YouTube, you can either raise your hand to ask questions or just write down questions in the chat box, and then I will read them out for you. But uh, now, without further ado, um, thank you so much for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel and Simon, and uh, wonderful initiative. Happy to be here and supporting um, all of you as you uh, are different processes of write your, writing your dissertations and thinking about um, the next steps. So the book uh, that I'm going to talk about, as you mentioned, builds from a lot of different academic papers we did. Uh, my co-authors and I decided that we wanted to make the findings accessible to the general public. So we published it in a trade publication rather than a academic one. And it's written in a manner which is um, uh, sort of takes out all of the um, uh, empirical and um, uh, methodologies, the charts that you, that you would normally see in, a, in an empirical paper um, and, and just sort of writes it in plain language. So uh, what the main theme of the book is what I can start with, right? The main theme is that um, that the court has changed over time. Uh, Indian Supreme Court is 75 years old this year. It is um, uh, one in five people in the world 
Um, it is the court of last resort for 20% of the world. And even though it's changed, there hasn't been a critical evaluation of uh, its institutional structures and processes and how it might accommodate um, and how it might change over time, those, how, how we, they may need to change those over time, um, taking into account the context and taking into account the historical changes and the economic growth of the country. So from a small court of eight judges, uh, taking about a thousand matters a year, today it has 34 seats and receives an upwards of 60,000 petitions. From being a forum for the, quote, legal quibbling of men with long purses, the court today actively seeks to be a people's court. It aims to provide access to the common person and give voice to the voiceless. However, as we describe in the book, our data suggests that the court structure and processes often work at cross purposes with its role. And, and this book, um, unlike other books on sort of apex courts, uh, looks at the court as a whole, right, rather than individual cases. Um, it identifies these gaps uh, between intent and outcome. Um, as a background, how did this project start? Since we do have a, uh, uh, Danielle is from Cornell, I would like to just mention that it actually started with a formal colleague of mine at Cornell when I was teaching there, uh, Ted Eisenberg, who is quite frankly, the founder of what's now a well-known established field in the U.S. Legal Academy, Empirical Legal Studies. He just approached me in the faculty lounge and said, hey, why don't we have any studies like this about one of the most important courts in the world? And um, uh, together with him, I was also planning to go on a Fulbright that year to India. We decided to launch this project to just gather all the data we could and uh, connect with all the people who are interested in gathering this data. So turning to what is the, the data that we used here, um, effectively five distinct data sets, and maybe this is the most interesting uh, part for you all. First, dozens of research assistants based in India and the United States read and coded over 6,000 cases, which is every published case by the Indian Supreme Court over a six-year period from 2010 to 2015. Second, we downloaded information from the court's website for about 1 million cases from 20, 2000 to 2018. The third data set, original data set we developed was four of, consisted of 466 civil cases filed at the court at tw on 2010. What we were trying to do was follow those cases through completion. Now, an average case, you know, at the Supreme Court could take four to five years. So we identified whether the advocate lost or won. The point was to see um, how certain types of advocates do, whether a senior advocate does better than a junior advocate or a non-senior advocate. We developed data on the biographical information of every judge to sit on the court, including age of appointment. We also created a high court justices data set. So um, about over 80% of appointees to the Supreme Court come for uh, our chief justices of high courts. So this help, data helped us determine what are the characteristics of, of people that the court prioritizes for appointment. So as a background um, uh, fact, right, the court is a very interesting um, appointment process, unlike many other courts in the world. Uh, effectively, the Chief Justice of India and four of the senior most justices uh, nominate candidates to the court. Uh, they call this the collegium, and it was developed in response um, at some points to feeling uh, that the executive was interfering um, and politically trying to manipulate uh, outcomes by uh, appointments. So this process has some benefits, but our book also points out the problematic features of it. Uh, and going kind of maybe diving into sort of the, 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 the problematic feature of it is that um, you know, we found over time that 
while um, the Collegium, which is created in 1993, has maintained the regional and religious diversity um, within the court in terms of the judges that are appointed, they have not maintained the gender and caste diversity. So uh, 11, for example, 11 of the 240 judges to have served in the court are women. Five were of uh, marginalized castes. And while the Indian polity, right, one of the problems with having this sort of insular system of appointments is that there's no accountability. The, the court recently rejected the idea that there should be a judicial commission. So they found that unconstitutional. But because they're insulated from what's happening in 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 the the politics, they don't have to take account of the fact of diversity. In uh, whereas Parliament recently passed a bill of reservations, India has this quota system where um, to uh, enhance diversity, there are quotas for people for women and for people of marginalized castes. And so the this is where we why it was important to look at the High Court um, justices' data sets. So we looked at. Um, uh, uh, as, as I mentioned, we found that 86% of the collegium appointed judges were high court chief justices. So we thought, okay, let's see, you know, if they cared about gender, then whenever they saw a female high court chief justice, they would appoint her. Um, but that doesn't turn out to be the case, right? They um, appointed only one in four female high court chief justices, whereas they appointed 36% of male Chief Justices. Now, there's no statistically significant difference, but the point remaining that, um, yes, there are fewer women already that they can choose from, right? There are fewer women in the high court system. So when you find a person at the highest level, uh, why are you less likely to appoint her than you are her male um, counterpart? Um, that was kind of one finding. And again, only something that we could do through this kind of data analysis, right? This was things that never before revealed about the court. Um, another thing kind of we found when I initially had mentioned that um, uh, the Supreme Court views itself paradoxically as a people's court, but in our view, it actually, um, uh, it's, it's, it's the way it, it manages the process of being a people's court uh, it does disservice to that ends. Um, it can't actually dispense justice to the common man, even though it takes this idea that it can. Um, so the way it effectuates this policy of look, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be the court for for anyone, right? Anyone can come to us, and it gives broad access. So it admits thousands of petitions a year and publishes a thousand cases. But instead of doing this. You know, our view is you as a common law court love, like, you know, coming from the British heritage as the United States does, um, you should take fewer cases, right? Currently, um, we also found that ninety over 90% of its appeals are discretionary, meaning uh, there's something called the special leave petition under the Constitution. It's that anyone can request to be heard by the Supreme Court for any reason. It's simply a mo another layer of appellate review. Um, and ironically, uh, you know, it admits cases where the lower two courts have agreed, and it rarely overturns that case. So it's wasting its time by admitting cases that lower two courts have agreed on, because it's simply just ratifying the decision. Um, and as we know the court is backlog, as we know that through the Indian system, it takes 13 years to um, get a decision. So this is not an, this is an efficient, inefficient waste of its time. Um, so all it's doing is extending the time about three years before the party has any finality and increasing the cost of litigation. So the court needs to do a better job of identifying a filtering mechanism, uh, creating a filtering mechanism to identify reverse worthy cases. And as a consequence of this liberal admission policy, it has little time right, to do the job of a common law court, which is to issue precedent that can be followed and applied by lower courts and examined by law lawyers who are examining whether or not to bring cases. Um, another study that is an empirical study, one of the few ones of the Supreme Court found that um, in about 
more than half of the, its cases, or actually sometimes in some years, all of its cases, the Supreme Court doesn't cite any precedent. And 60% um, of his cases are never cited again, right? So these are just, um, these network connections don't exist. And again, suggesting that these one-off decisions are, are, are a waste of time. But if it filtered better, it would have more time to devote to constitutional and precedent-setting cases, giving lower courts um, more finality, more consistency, and thereby reducing litigation, right, in the future. And as a result, really, it's the common person that gets its justice at its lower level. Right? India is a big country. The court is based in Delhi. And so uh, if, lower court, if the lower courts had better guidance, um, it could give more finality to the people who are less likely to be able to, to go to Delhi. So the other thing that we looked at is, um, you know, again, how do we deal with this um, uh, uh, process? What are what are the, the the causes of this delay and um, the possible solutions, right? So obviously, instead of uh, what the way in the Indian Supreme Court has tried to handle increasing litigation, and, and by the way, I have another paper with Ted and Nick Robinson about the fact that um, litigation is actually a very normal part of economic growth. In looking at the different states of India and doing sort of a difference in a difference analysis, we found that um, in the states that were more developed um, and more economically um, beneficial uh, and it had a higher level of economic growth, the litigation rate was higher. So as India has developed and um, overall since uh, liberalization in 1991, litigation rates um, has gone up and therefore the backlog has gone up. So again, instead of um, uh, what the court has done is let's just add more judges. Let's just keep working harder. And they decreased um, the bench size. So most cases, over 90% of cases are heard by two judge benches. And that's why you see them drop off and nobody ever cites them again. What court can do, I mean, they, these are remedies, right? So again, unlike a typical academic paper, we are suggesting solutions and they're controversial and they might not be implemented or they probably won't be implemented. And they also... Um, might create other problems, right? Unex unintended consequences, but we thought let's take this um, risk, let's make this a policy um, book. So we thought, right, create guidelines for admissionary, dis for, for discretionary cases. It's up to the court. They can decide whether to narrow special leave petitions or not. Um, examine whether two lower courts have agreed. When two lower courts have agreed, the court is 17 a um, uh, percent more likely to deny an appeal. Consider moving to appeals briefs, right? Right now, the court spends two working days a week on admissions. So people come in and do oral arguments as to why they need to, a hearing as to why their court case should be admitted. And each person typically has 93 seconds. The judge hears somebody for 93 seconds. Um, you can also empower lower courts so that, as I mentioned, they can follow better precedent. Another topic of our book, which I think is very interesting and again, um, controversial. So uh, when I say controversial, just I was just in India last month and we um, had a panel for the book with the Attorney General of India, the Solicitor General of India and two former Supreme Court um, chief justices. And, you know, many of them um, didn't enjoy the criticism, right? So one of them was like, court on trial, that's a nice title. Uh, who's putting us on trial? This is a former chief justice. Uh, you know, is it uh, is it the Indian people? Is it the parliament? Is it foreign foreigners? Uh, is it foreign courts? Um, and this particular, you know, uh, Theme I think is 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 touches you know people touches a nerve right, which is this, which is that uh, the Chief Justice of India uh, we suggest appoints judges in an outcome determinative way. Now, how does it do that? The Chief Justice has the power to strategically assign cases. Um, it can, and it what we found is that it over assigns cases to. 
uh, he, uh, it's never been a she, he over assigned cases to himself over other judges, and then also over assigns cases to junior judges that he himself has appointed to the court. Remember, I told you that they uh, have the ability to bring in, uh, they have the ability to nominate judges. Of course, this executive ratifies this, but it's typically just a ratification. They do, the executive does have some role. It's not that they have no role. And then the, the 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 benches that this chief justice constitutes, right? So as I mentioned, there are two judge benches, but in constitutional cases, they'll create five judge benches. And in these five judge benches or six judge benches, this the 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 the, the uh, people on the bench that he selected nearly always side with him. So there have been thousands of constitutional bench decisions in the last 75 years, <laughs> and the chief justice has been in dissent only 13 times. Uh, and in the period of our study, which is a six-year period of the 6,000 cases we read, not once was the chief justice in dissent. So, as I mentioned, we we do have you know number of um, yeah, here's another problem which which really is um, goes to sort of the 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 structures uh, as I mentioned. So one thing we hear about in India, and if you follow the Indian Supreme Court, um, a lot of liberal Indians are upset that the court effectively. Uh, is not standing up to democracy in India, is not standing up to human rights. There are decisions that have said, you know, you can go build a Hindu temple where a mosque was, right? You can uh, rat we've ratify um, how you've abrogated uh, uh, the, the semi-independent status of a state. And I can go on. But I think, and what people have done is sort of blamed um, the chief justice of India for these um, decisions. But what we point out that is that it's unlike the United States, right, where the ideology of judges are so important. There are nine judges. Um, you know, they 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 stay, they have life tenure. Uh, we know what they do, and they sit all sit together in a bench. It's always in bank. Um, and the Indian Supreme Court never sits in bank now. So over the last 10 years, right, there's been one prime minister of India. There's been one man in the executive. On the other hand, over the last 10 years, there's been 10 men who are chief justices. Now, why is that? And why is that a problem? So it's, you know, ironic, right? That the chief justice does have a lot of power. They have master of roster power. They have appointment power. Uh, he has um, also, it's sort of like the chief executive of almost the whole legal system and uh, power over high court appointments as well. They do that in, they do that jointly with the collegium of the high courts. So even though they have this power, they have, they're continually cycling out um, as a result of three factors. One is the mandatory retirement age of 65, which is in the constitution, uh, which, you know, actually came from the colonial courts. But in 1950, the life expectancy was like 30-ish in India, and now it's 70-ish. So these judges have a long life to live after they're forced to retire. That's That creates a whole different set of issues, which I'll talk about. But because they're forced to, but the chief justice is appointed as the senior most judge based on date appointment. So that he already has a limited time that he can be chief justice. And the third thing we also separately found is that the age of appointment has increased. So when when these judges are appointing each other, they're demanding that they've worked for a longer period of time. As a result, on average, judges are on the court for five years. And this is completely out of line with even if it were a term system, most Commonwealth countries have like seven year terms where there's terms. Um, and then the chief and average chief justice spends nine months as chief justice, right? So justices are getting their foothold. Um, of creating policies, of changing things, right? Some of these policies that we're suggesting, uh, like the special leave petition, you know, have less discretionary um, uh, 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 SLPs, appoint judges at lower ages, 
uh, so that they're on the court longer. So many of these policies that we suggested can be just undone by the next chief justice. As the chief justice is getting foothold, another one is coming. So the first female chief justice, for example, will be on the court in 2027 for 34 days. She'll be the chief justice. What can you do in 34 days? All it is is sort of a rubber stamping of your title and of your, uh, you know, they've made it to this highest level. Um, so that's one of the explanations of why they don't stand up, right, to the uh, 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 the executive. And when they retire at 65, right, one of their major employers is the government, it turns out. Uh, the government gives them, and the government is tracked as there's now more private arbitration that's happening due to the change from the economic system in 1991 from an from a in-court substitution socialist system to a more liberal um neoliberal, you know, capitalist system that's uh, more export, that, that's, that has borders open to economic, to, to, to corporations. So they're private arbitrations, but the government gives these people houses, huge houses and huge, um, you know, uh, cars, or not huge, but cars and staff. So that's why they're, they're um, an attractive employer. They'll go work on tribunals, for example. And so one study, again, not our own, but this another study from uh, from NUS found that these judges are pandering. Their decisions can be very seem to be pro government um, at, uh, at, uh, at at certain time periods when they're um, when they're going to be when, when when there's no election turnover. So those are the kind of inst you know, and that is another. Um, you know, reason that you're not standing up, right? So it's those institutional structures that are saddling the court, not necessarily the um, individual ideologies of the people. And so I think that's a new kind of finding and revelation that we um, that we have. There's some barriers to change as well. Um, the barrier, as in addition to the lack of consistent leadership in the court, are vested interests. Lawyers love this. Supreme Court lawyers love that there's no precedent. You know, when they're advising their court, their 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 court, their client, they can the, the client say, "Well, do you think I'll win?" Well, I don't know. Depends what judge will get. One judge has said that. One judge has said this. You have money. Go ahead. Let's file the case. So the Supreme Court bar is going to be very reluctant to any reduction in um. In, in their jurisdiction or any narrowing of the jurisdiction. Um, uh, and and, and uh, many of you may have heard, you know, Mark Gallanter and Nick Robinson have this paper called Grand Advocates, which are this sort of 20 or so judges, uh, lawyers, Supreme Court lawyers that make an inordinate amount of money. The highest paying lawyers in the world, $10 million, not kidding. Um, but why is that, right? Because of this, and I think this is sort of rent-seeking behavior, right? They have this because this inefficiency of the system that does oral arguments. People have 93 seconds. So these brilliant, you know, well-known um, uh, advocates who are older than the judges themselves, so these judges are gone, you know, by 65, uh, are are able to, to, to use sort of their abilities to get in these cases. And they certainly have a lot to lose. Um, another finding sort of, so we looked at is, yes, they clearly, we looked at, the, I told you about whether uh, the senior advocates are more likely to get in there, uh, uh, have their cases heard by the court. And the answer is yes, they're more likely to have their cases heard, but are they more likely to win? And the answer is no, they actually are more likely to lose. What does that tell you? One thing it tells us is, well, they're getting weaker cases admitted, right? Um, simply based on their, uh, they're brilliant. I'm going to say they're brilliant. I had um, a member of parliament, Abhishek Manu Singhvi, who's a good friend also, and he came to um, Seattle University and my students met him and they're like, wow, you have this feeling that you're amongst the greatest minds in the world. And I was like, yes, you absolutely do. But, you know, should he make $10,000 for 93 seconds? I don't know. Um, and uh, yes, so that's the that's sort of the um, the kind of problems and uh, uh, crises that we're pointing out. So to to summarize, you know what can be done, right? The solutions are are tentative. Uh, increasing the retirement age requires parliamentary action. 
increase it to 70. Most Commonwealth countries have 70 at this point. That's the mean. Um, is there an interest to do so? No. Prime Minister Modi loves it. Get these judges rolling out, you know, oh, five years, no one's around. Um, and, uh, and, and, and get them beholden to us because they're going to be young and they're going to be um, needing jobs after they leave. The court can itself narrow SLP jurisdiction, uh, which is that discretionary jurisdiction I mentioned, uh, or taking cases on the basis of discretion, uh, but they've chosen not to. And again, chief, one chief justice tells everyone to narrow it, the other one decides to undo the policies. Uh, they can, as I mentioned, oral arguments, they can do a different procedure for admissions, do it on the briefs, rather Indian is not a legal, the culture is a very oral culture. So that's a big, going to be a big change. The law schools um, don't actually do enough focus on legal writing and uh, brevity, but that's the, the problems with, with uh, implementing that. Um, and randomized judge selection. So why there's no reason that the chief justice has to be the chief, a master of the roster, let a computer do it. Um, and finally, the court itself, the collegium, the, the chief justice should prioritize gender and caste diversity, among other things, right? By appointing women to um, the Supreme Court and then by and, and appointing more women to the high courts and maybe take go broader. Why do you have to prioritize high court chief justices? You can go out into... Uh, go take people who haven't been judged. And um, relatedly, right, appoint them at younger ages, right? So you have a chief, you have chief justices for longer periods of time instead of at, at it's only increased over time, right? It says our data found that age of appointment has increased over time. So this book, you know, hopes to bring a new way of imagining the court of the future. It is, as India celebrates its 75th year, uh, our hope was to engage the larger Indian public in this conversation. I had a chance to speak at a Jaipur Literature Festival, which is one of the most popular global festivals. And the idea was to say, to to say, India, no, Indian, the uh, common Indian person doesn't even know all of the things that I've just told you. Um, uh, uh, they don't know how the structures work. And in fact, many people don't know all of the uh, all much of what I tell you. The Supreme Court lawyers in the bar, when you talk to them, they're like, "Yeah, we kind of know this um, uh, anecdotally, uh, but now we have data to show it, and we have, uh, and our hope is to engage the Indian public in this conversation." And it was, as I mentioned, written by academics in a way that was accessible to most Indian citizens. And ultimately, to answer the Chief Justice of India, it's those people that have the right to put the court on trial. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much um, uh, for this presentation. I think there were so many, um, so many interesting points in there. Um, we have entered now the, the Q&A session. Um, I'm sure there, there are going to be a lot of uh, questions and comments. Uh, again, uh, as I said before, uh, the event will be recorded and uploaded uh, to YouTube. So you can either raise your hand and ask questions yourself or just write them in the box. If you prefer that, and then I'm uh, I'm going to read them out to you. Um, please don't hesitate to ask any questions. Um, I actually would um, start with one, um, which is more on a very abstract level. I'm sure we're going to have more subst uh, substantial question uh, afterwards. Um, but I think it's going to be interesting for a lot of people here because most of us are um, have kind of like an international background, right? So we are PhD students or JSD students in the US or we teach in the US or we um, study in the US, but we also often come from a different country or have at least um, strong cultural and social ties to different countries, and we often work on these countries in a way, right? And a problem that at least I have encountered, and I'm sure a lot of other people have uh, encountered as well, is how to frame a project that is on the one hand appealing to the kind of US discourse that we are situated in, and at the same time um, appealing kind of to the to the to the um, country that you write about and to the discourse that you write about. And I. I think what's super fascinating about your book project is that there are many ways to read it. So a person like me, you know, outside of India, very like from an academic standpoint, this book for me is fascinating because it a, is a great, I think, very interesting case studies of one of the most interesting examples of, of constitutional jurisprudence, which is the Indian Supreme Court. And also because it's a great 
example of how you can use empirical research to kind of debunk the myths that we tend to have about uh, what jurisprudence is doing and maybe especially what constitutional jurisprudence is doing. Um, I'm sure there's a way a lot of people in India will read this book, and I think you kind of mentioned this in your talk, which is this has a lot of policy implications, right? So a lot of this is also kind of a policy proposal. Um, so my kind of question would be, what, what, which audience did you have in mind when you first conceived this book, when you developed the project, when you wrote it? Um, and also, that's kind of a sub-question, how did you kind of try to mediate the tension between these um, appealing to these very different kind of discourses, both in terms of ab abstractness, but also in terms of um, just different national discourses. Right. Oh, you, you just muted yourself. I think. Okay, great question. So what I think is that we initially started it not thinking of it as a book, um, thinking of it as just a bunch of different articles uh, that we wanted, to, we thought writing it for an American audience in American journals. Once we do have it in one in a German journal, I think that are is is sort of looking at Asia. Now, like the problem is right, the U legal academy is quite frankly not that interested in India, at least who hasn't been over the last decade, two decades that I've been working on the were uh, a professor. Maybe a little bit more interest will happen now with the foreign policies of the two countries being more aligned, but uh, it was a bit of a um, upward, you know, battle to 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 be writing on India for a U.S. legal audience. Uh, so we we weren't we published it as book chapters. Um, uh, you know, didn't didn't even submit it to law reviews. Didn't think that the law reviews would would uh, would you know care. Maybe international ones, but you know, uh, you know. I think this was also very. The, the papers were very empirical too. So so looking at some of the the um, you know, we looked at some of the empirical journals, and maybe that would had been the some of the natural places for it. So, uh, you know. Like, as I mentioned, yeah, writing it for an American audience, but then realizing also that this is quite significant, our findings, once we started to delve into it, we didn't think of it as a policy book either. It was just looking, there was so much data and we each of us had different ideas. I was let's look at diversity. My other colleague from India was like, well, let's look at the master of roster problem. And then how do we use the data to look at it? So we sliced and diced it in William, who's the empiricist and, you know, has uh, you know, a team of people that can do all this data analysis work with him and the post Sander Institute would implement all of our, uh, all of our questions and, um, and uh, sort through, you know, sort of this kind of data analysis work is, is, is a bit like uh, looking for gold, right? You, you'll have to sift, you have to sift through a lot of sand before you find anything um, that is worthy of, of talking about. And then ultimately it became clear that this would, you know, there are a billion people in India um, and not all of them care or want to read the book, but a lot of them do care about this and that we could actually offer some meaningful contributions to policy. So that's how we shifted it to, to a policy book for wider appeal and written in a, in a, um, in a, as I mentioned, uh, easy to access. There's very few charts, very few, no regressions. And, you know, we'll have data on our website. Well, I've sent you the website. We're, can, we're working on putting up the data so people can, who do care to delve into it, can delve into it. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. Um, Simon? Yes. Um, so I, I really, I, I really enjoyed um, the presentation in terms of, I, I learned, I think, um, the the ideology itself um, may not be um, as as important as we see in the United States, but the structural um, issues. Um, my my grandfather also served on the Supreme Court in Taiwan um, when he was still alive, and and it gave me a lot of sort of uh, understanding of how that how the court really um, works. And then looking in Taiwan, the United States, and now thinking about um, India. So, so, so the the question here kind of goes into the, the the two sort of two reform proposals that we see maybe in 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 both places. So, so in the United States, 
um, one question, um, and actually seen in, in, in multiple places about, which is about the compensation. Um, how judges, how well are judges being compensated? Um, Justice Thomas has been saying that he has, he doesn't believe that he's being compensated enough. And then there's all the controversies about um, sort of um, the, the sponsorship that he gets um, out of um, a lot of different sources. Um, I, I, I'm curious about, um, is that also sort of an issue um, in within the Indian Constitutional Court in terms of co um, compensation rate and, and how that relates um, uh, for uh, to to private fundings or or, or sort of that relationship. Um, the the second part is um, is in Taiwan where um, the Supreme Court justice come from two sources. One is from academia and the other is um, from judges. And, and the the question is, are these should we treat these um, Supreme Court justice as judges and to enjoy all the benefit of what the judge can enjoy, um, and, and that includes. Um, conversation at, even after they leave the bench. Um, so again, it's I'm curious about sort of that um, part of the that 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 trail of the discussion in the context um, of the Indian Constitutional Court in your in your findings and your research. Right. Yeah. Great. So the judges um, something very unique, right? They have access to these amazing. Uh, properties in the middle of Delhi that aren't really even any one, unless you're, um, you know, a top 10 billionaire in India, you can't buy anything and it's not even available if you wanted to. So that is super, that's, that's what they get. And they get a staff and they get a car and they get a driver. Um, their salaries are not huge. And that's why one of the things, and so they, maybe they don't have that much savings unless they were doing something else. Um, were litigating before they became a judge. Many of them don't even want to leave actually practice to become judges. Uh, so once at 65, they retire, then that becomes, a, they'll never be able to afford those houses again. And that's why it's tempting for them to go get government jobs because the government, when they're head of these tribunals or human rights commissions, they're also then again given um, you know, uh, housing in many cases. So. And that's why that creates those sort of pandering incentives to the government, as I mentioned. Um, whether there's corporate, you know, I, I think not as much, right? So again, if you think the difference between Thomas and a typical Indian Supreme Court justice, Thomas, I don't know, has been on the bench for what, 20, 30, 40 years? You know, they don't leave because of life tenure. And so uh, he's someone that is building a relationship with him would be meaningful, whereas building a relationship with the Chief Justice of India, their come and go may not be worth cultivating, assuming that a corporation would want to in, in any event. Um, yeah, does that is there was there a third question there that I didn't answer? Yeah, no, no, that um, yeah, the third the third question is uh, is is more about the um um like after after they they leave the bench um is there like a policy discussion of continue to treat them as a judge in in some in some ways um instead of just uh just <laughs> losing all of the privileges yeah there. i mean they get a pension they do get a pension it's not 100% the same as the pension they got before but it's the housing benefit that they lose and um you know another thing the constitution says is that they can't practice so that becomes a uh, uh, you know, another challenge for them to to uh, uh, to support themselves. But I mentioned arbitrations, private arbitrations are what many more are doing now. And that can be lucrative. But, you know, they get their honorary title of chief. They're always going to be the former ch chief justice and they're invited to things and events. And It's very interesting. Um, Nafas Kamal? Hello, um, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Okay, um, I have two questions. So the first one is, um, so can you step back to our um, judicial appointment process, like from the, um, yeah, the lowest court? Yeah, what are like qualifications for judges? And my second question is like, um, do you have like data or number of like how many years of experience um, that those judges like 
half before they serve at the uh, Supreme Court, like average number. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the question. Um, the 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 lower courts are uh, often sort of test based. You know, I think you take an exam um, in the extraordinarily low courts. Then, then after that, there's a hot, and I don't know that much about lower courts, so I'll admit. So take that with, you know, a grain of salt. I do know the high courts, right, are like the, um, our, maybe our federal court of appeals, except it's more of a unitary system uh, rather than dual system as the U.S. The high courts are also, again, appointed by what I call as a collegium. The chief justice of the high court, along with four senior judges, um, appoint, make appointments, but then they also collaborate with the Collegium of the Supreme Court. So it's a similar kind of appointments process. And the Supreme Court, as I mentioned, the Chief Justice and four senior most judges, they do it in privacy. Um, sometimes they had minutes, but we don't know why they choose people or why they don't choose certain people. Um, there is really no accountability or transparency to the process. And, um, and this, as I mentioned, was created by the Supreme Court in 1993, they themselves said, look, uh, the, the, the Constitution requires us to do this. Your executive led process is not working. Um, four years ago, five years ago, the parliament passed in an, an amendment to uh, create a judicial commission that would have uh, one or two ordinary people, judges, uh, people from both parties. And the court said that's against the basic structure of the doctrine or unconstitutional. Um, so that's sort of the, the yeah. And oh, yes, the final question, age of appointment. Yeah, I'm just looking there in that, pa we, we do have a paper called uh, from executive appointment to, um, to the collegium, which I'll paste here uh, in the thing. And I think in that paper, uh, we do say, the age, uh, what is the average age appointment? Obviously it's 60 because if I say the average, age, and it's increasing over time, if the if the age of appointment is, um, if the average time they leave the court is 65. Um, but in this particular paper, if you wanna take a look at it, and I don't remember it offhand, I know we uh, have, have uh, explained over time how that's grown. Okay, um, uh, Choki. Hi, thank you, Professor uh, Ciro. Uh, um, I'm Choki from University of Washington. Uh, we're same in Seattle, so I hope you enjoy the. Oh hi. <laughs> I hope you enjoy the sun outside there right now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I have um two questions. Uh, first, uh, related to the substance. Um, uh, I know you're focusing on how the court works, but uh, but you know, um. From your findings, uh, do you consider one of the findings uh, will also help us better understand about the democratic backsliding uh, literature? Uh, since um, you know some some of the countries, uh, presidents or executive co-opted their uh, judiciary to serve uh, their own purpose. Um, and and the second one, uh, we are all interested in the methodology. Uh, Simon and Daniel uh, gather us. So uh, I'm really interested in your uh, approach method in collecting da data, analyzing data, and it, you know, uh, it involves numerous law students and uh, universities, not only in United States, but also in, in Delhi. So what lessons can you share uh, to us uh, in order to gather, collaborate, and work right. with numerous people with, a, you know, more than three or five years. Uh, yeah, that's all my questions. Thank you. Great. Um, so first I will say in the link that I sent of the website, if you look under research, you'll be able to find the chapters, you know, maybe three of them, I guess, that we published uh, that have more of the methodology, um, particularly in this qualified hope, this book chapter with um, book edited by Rosenberg and Krishnaswamy. Uh, that really uh, kind of lays out our methodology and more clearly. 
So if you want to delve into that, but the um, lessons that we learned is that it's first, we started with law students in Ithaca and it's obviously much harder for American law students to try to read Indian cases than it was for Indian law students to read Indian cases. Then we moved to doing having it done at the Indian law students at the National University in Delhi. And then we compared kind of the two code, you know, because they would look at the case, we had 60 variables. So, you know, um, the name of the judge, the how long it took, uh, was the litigant an individual or the government, um, uh, you know, many, many other variables like that. And so we did some tests to make sure that the two groups uh, came to the same results. Um, other lessons is really, do you need these, you need the expertise to do this kind of work? I have stat layer one expertise in this, in the sense that I kind of know how to ask the questions, um, and can do very basic data analysis. I can do basic data stuff, but I couldn't do the really in-depth stuff. I'm not wedded in the meta methodology the way William is. Um, William Hubbard is. So having him was key and essential to a project of this nature. But then, you know, having Aparna was key and essential to the project of this thing. She's a constitutional lawyer. She actually has her JSD from Yale. Um, so she understands the kind of American Academy and American um, methodologies, but she's steeped in India. So she could then say, hey, this is not right, this doesn't work, this is not sensitive to our culture. And then I guess I can bring in, I brought some, the comparative piece uh, of this in, in some ways and the focusing on, you know, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, certain questions that I knew, uh, thought about because I had also worked in Colombia, also obviously know some, something about the United States courts. So uh, I think that was really uh, great to the team, the, 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 because that collaboration was necessary to produce a book of this nature. We wouldn't want to not have, you know, an Indian author based in India uh, to, to, and, 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 and undertake this work. I know a lot of empiricists do. I know a lot of empiricists, well, a lot of empiricists will just go to any particular area and say, okay, we can look at it look at the data and make conclusions. And I don't feel comfortable with that. I think it's very context specific because of, of the, 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 you know, comparative work I do. I also view it as a com context specific. Some comparativists also go and say, okay, we're going to go learn about a new country that we don't ever learn about. And we're going to write about it and compare it. I also don't do that. And I don't feel comfortable with that. Most of my work is comparing India to the U S I don't really work outside of those um countries i can one i don't think like i i just think it needs you know i ha go to india every year i speak the language i um have a community there of lawyers of academics so i feel just that that's for me um gives me more comfort in writing about a country than 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 like some people are wonderful and brilliant and go to like every country lots of countries in the world and maybe they stay there. Maybe they know something about it that is deeper. But I think that that, that deep historical knowledge, the deep current events knowledge, uh, is important. Um, I'm going to ask one very short last question, and then I think we could, uh, should wrap it up. So um, it's it's kind of a follow up. Um, it's always very interesting to me, basically, how you do the coding in these kind of um, kind of things. So how do you write the criteria, right? Because um, at some point, so I mean, your fr the framing of the book is you have these six takeaways that are, I think, like six, right? So w which are always like kind of debunking kind of a myth that we have about the Indian Supreme Court. Um, but at some point, you had to know that there's a there there, right? There's something to debunk. At what, I mean, you design kind of the criteria with having, um, it would be kind of um, not satisfying to ask for the gender um um, composition of the court and then find, oh, actually it never changed. And I mean, that, that's not a, not a great story to tell. So basically my, my, uh, my question is at what point of the process did you know there was a there there and how much did that influence kind of the coding or did you just gather huge amount of data? Yeah. And then, 
Yeah. I think I think the coding we would have liked to do differently if we thought about it more, actually, because that started early and they were like, oh, shoot, we never looked if the party is a corporation. We looked individual or petitioner. We could have learned so much had we done that. Um, so the initial coding is a very broad level. Uh, we did have input. Um, we did even have input from Aparna. I um, mean, obviously, those you 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 want to have the the country expertise and say the hunches of what are you looking to find. But it was a very, like I said, you know, uh, like a, a expansive exercise. You know, looking through dirt to find something meaningful. Later on, as we um, did, you know, kind of micro studies, then we had hunches, right? Obviously, there why are, that we knew that there are not enough women. We didn't know about the cast because it's very hard you don't look at the person and it's it's also people don't necessarily it, it's data that's actually not publicly available one of the ways india has decided to deal with caste is to just not talk about it and so we had to it's not on their website um where gender is ages everything else so we had to look for that and thought okay well let's see all the er ways in which diversity happens we couldn't know what the high courts we couldn't know that they disproportionately select men when of these it, it, when it comes to chief justices we just had hunches so i think then at those levels when you have the data and then you, you can and some of the new data sets we developed about the senior advocates because again we had a hunch we had to develop it on a hunch i mean this is hard stuff to do i mean okay for you folks that don't necessarily have the research assistant support and the transnational collaborations, and then the sophisticated data analysis where William has actually like, you know, yeah, people who have who have PhDs who can who can say, hey, do all this data analysis work at the initial level. So it's definitely hard. Plus, it's even harder for you guys, not harder. I mean, it's a phase where I am at my career, right? In yours, you're like, okay, I need to publish at depending on what you want to do. If you want to be an academic in the US, I want to publish an American law review, or I want to publish a, a, this particular, you know, in Germany, it might be different. In Taiwan, it might be different. So um, and you wanted, and you'll have to do academics. It, you're going to be speaking to those 20 people in your field that are going to get you hired, right? Um, whereas we are able to say, okay, I don't, you know, we don't, we're, we're at a different point in our careers. We don't need to, we didn't want to continue speaking. I don't want to continue speaking to the 20 people in, 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 in a field. And I wanted to start speaking to, and I had to push a little bit. My co-author, Aparna, was a little bit um, it took 10 years. So she was a little bit more junior and she was a little bit more uncomfortable going into the, you know, public realm and, and talking to the public. But now when we met, you know, it, at the Jaipur Literature Festival, she's like, this is great. This is amazing. I'm very happy that we did this. And she was also, you know, ready in her career to, to make the, the leap out to the, um, to take the um, bridge the gap between, you know, um, the public work and, and academic work. Yeah, great. Um, that's, that's super interesting. Um, unfortunately, we have one out of time. Before I let you go, I would ask if you, if possible, to, um, just turn on the camera for a moment so Simon can take a quick, um, quick photo, like a screenshot for our, our social media. Yeah, no, thank you, Daniel. Um, and thank you, Professor, I'm for your inspiring <laughs> session. And Gianluca, you can turn on your camera if you have uh, the, if you can. Um, but I think yeah, it's on, right? Isn't it not on? It, it is. Uh, I think Gianluca has his uh, camera. It, my off. camera doesn't work very well. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I know Gianluca is a big fan of uh, your books. So. <laughs> All right. Um, let's do it. One, two, three. Um, I'm going to take um, another one. Um, counting one, two, three. All right, perfect. Great. Um, so again, thank you so much, Professor. Thank everyone for joining. I think this was a great and very insightful. Thank discussion. you so much for having me. I was really good time speaking with you. Thank you so much. Take yes. care. Um, Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs>